Hello everyone, my name is Rajiv Jairaman, the founder and CEO of Nolscape, and I welcome all our listeners and viewers from different parts of the globe to the first episode of the podcast series, The Learning Curve, powered by Nolscape. Disruption is real. The very definitions of work, worker, and the workplace have been completely redefined, making organizations further vulnerable to disruption. And in these dynamic times, organizations are faced with the challenge of striking the right balance between futurizing, personalizing, and humanizing, something we acronymize as FPH. With that in perspective, the learning curve has been designed to serve as a platform for conversations on how leading organizations and leaders are embracing the important FPH principles and aligning those to their work, worker, and the workplace. Future readiness is critical, and in this podcast series, we will be featuring insightful discussions with HR, L&D, human capital, leaders, business leaders, innovation leaders from exemplary organizations to delve into the strategies, challenges, and successes these leaders experience as they navigate the future of work. For today's episode, we have a very special guest with us, Avneesh Sabarwal, Managing Director, Accenture Ventures and Open Innovation. I go back in time with Avneesh. We've shared wonderful experiences together, uh, you know, professionally when we got started as an organization. The very first um, corporate connect we had was with Avneesh. We were part of the Accenture um, Open Innovation group back then. Avneesh is an innovator, strategist, and a technology evangelist with 30 plus years of extensive experience and track record around market making, growth hacking, corporate innovation, digital transformation, leadership development for top Fortune 500 companies in both mature and emerging markets. Avneesh has a successful track record of building new practices and service-based organizations from inception. Prior to Accenture, Avneesh has worked with IBM's Global Business Services in India and the United Kingdom for almost a decade in various leadership roles. He has served in the Indian Armed Forces for seven years and has performed the role of aide de camp of the governor of Madhya Pradesh. Well, the list of his accomplishments is endless, but what better way to kickstart the podcast series than hosting Avneesh on the show? Hi, Avneesh. Welcome to The Learning Curve. Thank you very much, Rajiv, for having me here and uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, as you rightly said, for us also, when I started the team, uh, you know, almost a decade back, uh, Nolscape uh, was our first startup. So there's always a, a very warm feeling and a soft, uh, you know, kind of a angle whenever I think about uh, you and uh, and Nolscape. And, you know, I think since then I have uh, got... Uh, uh, meeting with a lot of your team members as well. So yeah, it's, it's almost like a homecoming. Good to be back and uh, doing this podcast with you. Awesome. Thank you so much for those kind words, Avnish. So to begin with, um, I'm sure the audience wants to know a bit about your professional journey and what led you to your current role. Can you share something on your background with us? Yeah, happy to do that. So my current role, uh, as you had said, is about... Uh, leading Accenture Ventures and Open Innovation Program. And in this, uh, we basically partner, invest, and acquire deep tech, deep science, and climate tech startups. So I built this team from scratch, and today we are regarded as uh, one of the most uh, successful corporate uh, innovation and corporate venture program running not only in India, but uh, globally. So uh, the journey uh, started... Uh, obviously in a very different area. When I started my profession, I, I actually joined the Indian Army and uh, spent uh, seven years there along with another two years with the uh, the governor of Madhya Pradesh in the capacity of ADC. Uh, post that, uh, I took a break and then I, you know, I left the Army and went for my MBA to London. And uh, then I was picked up by IBM in London only. And I started my corporate career in London uh, with IBM. And uh, that was about uh, management consulting and I focused on automotive industry. So that is how my corporate career actually got uh, going. And then after that, uh, I was given an opportunity by IBM to relocate to India and uh, build an offshore strategy consulting team 
which had not been done earlier. So I came here and uh, we built a team from zero to 500 consultants who were serving uh, global clients of IBM. Uh, and then in 2011, I basically came to Accenture and started off my role as a head of strategy for the India domestic business and for the global technology business of Accenture. And in one of my recommendations, when we were going through the phase of digital transformation uh, as, a, as a strategy lead, I recommended to my leaders and superiors that uh, if Accenture wants to be a leader in digital transformation, it is no longer enough for us to you know, just build things on our own and rely on our big partners like SAP, Microsoft, and Oracle. It was important for us to start working with more disruptive, agile, and nimble startups, which had started attacking value chains of uh, large industries and businesses. Now, sometimes you have to be careful of what you wish for. And uh, you know, my superior said that, well, sounds like a great idea. So why don't you go and build that team? So that's how I landed in this role because your question was, you know, how did I come here? And this is my journey, yes. that role. That's how I landed. But I think uh, looking backwards, it was probably the best uh, decision of my life. And then the last 10 years have been incredible working with, uh, you know, fantastic uh, startup founders like yourself. And I have, uh, you know, enjoyed every moment of it. Awesome. That's, that's a fascinating journey, Amish. Thanks for sharing that. So, you know, in 2019, I published this book called Clearing the Digital Blur. And I, I speak about being a boundaryless organization in that, right? So what you're describing here is really Accenture becoming boundaryless, not just through partnerships with SAP and Microsoft and all the biggies, but also creating an ecosystem with uh, startups, right? And, and, and startups obviously are operating at a different pace and they are disruptive. Uh, so it's wonderful to hear uh, this particular evolution of this concept, right? Where ecosystem is becoming core to an organization strategy. Yeah, so I that's think wonderful uh, to hear. Yeah. Just to add, there we have extended our ecosystem beyond startups now and uh, working closely with the academia as well. Right. So uh, you know we work with academia, we do joint research with them, and then each of these institutes, for example, like IIT Madras, have big uh, research parks as well. So they have right. their own startup ecosystem, which we are trying to bring in also, uh, you know, into the fold. So, yeah, I think, you know, going beyond the big boys to startups and now to academia uh, has been a fascinating journey. But you are absolutely right. You know, earlier we used to have these roles called uh, IT architect and, uh, you know, yeah. enterprise architect. Now we have an ecosystem architect role whose basic, whose basic responsibility is to come up with the new ecosystem for the organization and it's completely aligned with the corporate and business strategy. That's wonderful to hear. Does this ecosystem also include uh, governments? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, it's, it's, you know, the entire ecosystem, if you talk about the startup ecosystem, it includes the academia, the government, the, you know, the accelerator, the incubators, VCs, private equity. So the entire ecosystem needs to come together if we want to take a lead, uh, you know, in areas, for example, AI and now Gen AI. Awesome. That's a good segue into my next question. You have a wonderful vantage point looking at this ecosystem, which is wide and diverse and global. So as MD of Accenture, with this kind of um, vantage point that you have, how do you identify collaboration and investment opportunities in the Gen AI space? The reason why we are starting with this question is, as an organization, Allscape also works with uh, you know, a lot of large enterprises. Even today, there is a lot of concern around Gen AI. There is this hype versus reality question that often pops up. Right. So in that context, how do you evaluate collaboration and investment opportunities, specifically in the Gen AI space? Yeah, it's a great question, Rajiv. And uh, so we actually just finished our Open Innovation Summit, uh, where we had uh, extensive uh, focus on uh, Gen AI this time. So we were looking at uh, four areas of Gen AI. The first answer to your question is that how did we go about identifying opportunities and what kind of plays we want to play with or, or partner with, right? So we looked at Gen AI and divided that into four key areas. The first one was about workforce transformation. Now, this is a lot about in the area where you are operating as well, right? And uh, a big part of uh, workforce transformation was this new thing, which is uh, getting a lot of uh, 
attention now which is agent tech ai right and uh, ai agents and how they are going to transform the the workplace so the first thing was to look into workforce transformation that was our first category second was about functions transformation so there's a lot of uh, work going on uh, in gen ai space around functions so sales marketing finance legal all these uh, functions are getting disrupted and uh, customer service you know is probably one of the biggest use cases of gen ai so our second uh, block was functions then the third one was a very interesting one which is about digital core transformation now we know gen ai it's got very cool applications uh, which is built on the llms but there is a big uh, infrastructure layer which right. is uh, you know which is part of this whole thing right so there we have things like for example data uh, responsible ai uh, platforms so we wanted to look at uh, you know in the earlier saas days you know you had uh, for example you know companies which were in the api space for example yeah. and they were doing a lot of things browser stack comes to my mind and many others which were there so what is what are the new uh, you know postman and browser stack for gen ai so we wanted to identify yeah. those areas and the fourth were very interesting area was about industry specific transformation right so which are the companies which are transforming specific industries uh, so this is how we actually went about uh, segmenting our search for gen ai startups in the area uh, of you know what i have just described to you and uh, and based on a very you know finely curated process we were able to come up Uh, with our top companies and uh, yeah, last uh, last week we had the uh, you know the big event and uh, four winners out of this were uh, were identified now what were the criteria in terms of uh, selection one of the big criteria which we were looking what you know which is slightly different from some of the other ones which we have done earlier is that we wanted to see how much of this is real gen ai right because uh, a lot of if you go and look at the demos and videos of a lot of startups and new companies which are building this actually it's just a wrapper a lot of these companies overnight have uh, you know pivoted and i'm not accusing them for it because that's what i think uh, was needed as well because you know a gen ai thing just hit us from nowhere and i think our startup ecosystem also you know if i have to say it was a little late uh, compared to what was happening in uh, you know especially us Uh, so i think so we were making sure that the kind of startups or the kind of partners we were looking into gen ai had a, a genuine kind of a, you know application or infrastructure layer so that was one thing which we were very clear and the second was that you know are they really solving big uh, business problems right so in the end it is very important that uh, they are able to solve business problems and they are able to go beyond just doing a poc and get integrated into the entire value chain so these were some of the things uh, we wanted to know and say okay you know if these are the things which our startups can provide then they are ideal partners for accenture for uh, either making strategic investments or uh, folding them in our open innovation program which is around collaboration but also uh, you know as potential uh, acquisition targets for us so we look at partnership investments and acquisitions and try and see you know accenture as you know is is probably the leader now in gen ai we have our own technology capabilities which we have been building at the uh, year mark 3 billion investments in ai so there's a lot happening here but you know there are gaps which uh, point solutions from these uh, disruptive startups can fulfill and and we are looking for those point solutions which can help us uh, augment our gen ai capabilities and help us keep ahead of the race Awesome. That's such a comprehensive answer you've given me. Um, you know, rich in detail. So just to summarize, you're saying workplace transformation, right? Uh, you're saying functional transformation, uh, core digital, and domain. These these are the first level filters uh, that you're using to evaluate. And within that, you are looking for business impact, uh, real versus hype, right? Which one's a wrapper, and which one's doing something more fundamental or foundational. right which could leave a lasting impact on business so my next question is uh, about that business impact that you just spoke about um can you talk about how gen ai currently is transforming business to begin with the cover story here is 
today we are seeing nvidia you know splitting at its seams uh, right trillion dollars and and becoming a behemoth and every large technology organization is doubling down on gen ai so they are seeing something uh, in this but at the same time there are a lot of naysayers also that it's going to take us ages before we can start to see any kind of roi coming out of uh, gen ai so from that context can you speak a little bit about how gen ai is transforming business yeah rajiv i think a uh, good question um make see there is a lot of lot being talked about gen ai i think uh, you know everybody's been saying that it is the iphone moment and uh, you know if you look at uh, in 5 days they were able to reach 1 million users and all those kind right. of things. so i think and and big uh, you know players have all have given lofty statements about uh, the impact of gen ai um, and i think to be honest you know since the internet we have had many technologies and you are well aware of them but none of them has made it uh, to the board level to be honest right uh, these technologies whether it was uh, you know social media or whether it was analytics or you know whether it was industry x they were all very key technologies but none of them really made it to the board level and now you know in our research 98% of the board is discussing uh, yeah. about gen ai and uh, from accenture research we have also found out that 40% of all working hours can be automated and augmented by llms uh, and gen ai right so the uh, you know the big hairy audacious goal is is really you know significant what what we are talking about here but on the other hand uh, we still haven't had large scale deployments where you can find out you know big transformation uh, benefits so at the moment a lot of it is happening into what we call uh, you know uh, you do these assessments you do build deployment and integration you know we doing a lot of work with our clients on workforce transformation uh, then gen ai ops is you know what we were talking about earlier as well but a lot of ex what i call experimentation is going on which means that uh, about 30 to 40% of gen ai uh, projects tend to end uh, at a poc level right and uh, i think there's a lot of fomo as well where organizations are trying to say okay let's just get one project done and dusted and uh, and then it's good so i think you know going beyond the poc into the real integration because if you have a you know overall value chain and you divide that into different processes what is happening is that uh, one poc is happening in one part of the business right but the rest of the benefits if you want to really get the benefits you need to touch the entire value chain or the entire business process or the workflow which is something which has just started happening so a lot of work around experimentation and uh, you know uh, uh, poc is definitely happening across industries but a uh, gen ai led business transformation which is the real goal i think of all organizations that's still a uh, work in progress and evolving uh, but uh, you know if you look at different industries uh, again there you will find that uh, different industries have different uh, you know areas where they are in terms of gen ai adoption so banking and insurance and capital markets uh, in our research and in our work with uh, customers are right at the top in terms of both automation and augmentation so i think those are some some which are right at the top but then some industry like for example chemicals or automotive or uh, you know industrial they are still adopting it and looking at how much of their uh, processes can be either augmented or automated so it's different a little bit different in terms of the industries also from a domain or you know from a function perspective we are seeing that uh, there is a there's a lot of work going on in finance in legal uh, you know in uh, sales and marketing so all these functions are definitely getting disrupted so you know if you look at this way then you can probably draw a matrix of industries and different right. functions and then see which ones uh, have the maximum potential for aut automation and augmentation and which ones have not right so i think there's a lot going on accenture itself we are you know we want to be the uh, uh, you know the best use case or the best case study you know if we may call it for our clients in terms of our own uh, work which we are doing right uh, so 
if you look at us as a corporate, uh, you know, how, what are we doing? So one of the things which we are doing is that we are rotating, right? So we are rotating all our existing book of business and services to Gen yeah. AI, right? So that's the first, rotate. The second is we are differentiating. So all our proposals, uh, we are differentiating by using Gen AI to win new opportunities and sales in existing services, which we offer to our clients. So rotate, differentiate, and the third one is capture. We are looking at capturing new revenue streams with Gen AI. So, and we want to be, as I said, our, you know, our, be our own best credential. So these are the three big things which we are doing. Now, what are they powered by? They are powered by a very robust uh, center of excellence, which we have built on Gen AI, uh, which we, LLM, COE, uh, go to market, talent and training. We have uh, almost trained 80,000 uh, employees right. uh, on Gen AI. Uh, marketing uh, ecosystem, we are doing investments, acquisitions, and then a very important part, which I forgot to mention last in the question as well of what we are looking in our partners, uh, Rajiv, and what we are doing in Accenture is something around responsible AI. Right. right. That's a very big part of our way of looking at which partners to look at. So, you know, there might be some companies which are great in the technology, but if they don't fit into our definition of responsible AI, and sometimes, to be honest, uh, that makes us a bit maybe uncompetitive as well, right? If you're saying, okay, you know, what is the cost of, let's say, building a solution using Gen AI with or without responsible AI? Uh, there might be a difference in that, but that's okay for mm. us. We want to make sure that we go ahead with responsible AI. So, yeah, a long answer to your question, but these are what we think is happening in different industries and functions of what we see with our clients. Oh, that's awesome to hear. And I know Accenture has started reporting Gen AI numbers already, which is a, a great. Yeah, we did. Uh, we did two yes. billion, uh, you know, in three quarters. And before that, uh, we had done, uh, you know, about we had done three fifty million before that. So three fifty million to two billion. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a strong finish to the entire year, and then you know, looking forward to FY twenty five as well. So yes, I think uh, uh, definitely the the effort is paying off, but again, you know, I have to be modest here and say that we are also investing 3 billion, right? Yes. So an investment of 3 billion uh, has got us 2 billion uh, revenue till now, right? So it's a long way off, but I am glad that, uh, you know, we are uh, we are ahead in the race. Got it. And, and what you're essentially saying is a lot of companies are now experimenting, right? So, you know, 30, 40% is leading to a POC, but organizational transformation is still work in progress, right? So um, we are in that journey. So that leads me actually to the next question. Uh, in the AI built to scale report by Accenture, um, we saw this interesting data point which says 84% of C-suite executives believe that, that they must leverage AI to achieve growth objectives with many integrating AI into their core innovation strategies, right? Um, now, in all of this, there is uh, something different that leaders have to do, right? At Nolscape, we think in terms of how do we uh, help organizations and leaders become future ready through experiential learning. So this is very interesting for us, this data point. So what do leaders have to do differently in the context of AI, given that massive experimentation is going on, there is fear of missing out, some will be roaring success, others will be incredible failures. In all of this, what should leaders be doing, right? And how do we develop leaders to be future ready in the context of Gen AI? Yeah, I think fantastic question, Rajiv, because uh, leadership is one area which will get severely uh, impacted and the kind of leadership you are looking for is completely different to the kind of leaders we were, uh, you know, we have been used to earlier. So, you know, this is my view in terms of how leveraging AI impacts leadership development, right? So the first thing is about data-driven decision-making. So I would say that leaders will increasingly now rely on AI to make informed decisions based on, uh, you know, data and analytics. So this requires developing skills uh, to understand, yeah. interpret AI-generated insights and integrate them into, you know, the strategic decision-making process. So I think there is no leader now who who can be not trained uh, in, in Gen AI, if I have to say so, uh, because I think there is no uh, scope for that. So data-driven decision-making is a key skill uh, which the leaders would need. Second, I would talk about agility and responsiveness, right? So AI enables very fast uh, processing of information and trend forecasting. 
So I would say that the you know the leaders of today would need to adapt uh, to a more dynamic decision making uh, environment where you know very swift adaptation and responsive uh, responses are critical. Third one where I play a lot is about uh, you know innovation and creativity. So with AI handling routine and data heavy tasks, uh, I think the leaders can now focus on fostering innovation and creativity within their teams. And this will need to cultivate an environment of experimentation where AI is seen as a collaborative partner in the innovation process, right? Uh, and that's what we were talking about earlier, you know, in workflows, agent tech AI is coming up uh, in a big way. Right. So innovation, creativity definitely will get a big boost because a lot of routine work will happen, you know, through these agents. Uh, fourth point, very important, uh, you know, which uh, which is earlier I talking about responsible AI. So here I talk about ethical leadership, right? Yeah. AI becomes more prevalent uh, ethical con considerations around data use, privacy, and the broader societal impact of AI's uh, technologies become, uh, you know, key and paramount. So leaders must be equipped to navigate these ethical dilemmas and ensure responsible AI use, right? A lot of these, for example, AI tools are being now used for hiring, as you know, right? Learning yes. and development, assessment. So how do you make sure that it is out of bias and ethical way of, uh, you know, doing this is happening right in the organization? So I think uh, ethical leadership will be very important. We already talked about technical proficiency. So you need to update your technical proficiency. Uh, I think leaders will be big change agents going forward. So implementing AI solution often requires significant change management like any other technology, but this is a pretty big one because uh, you know there is a lot of speculation that uh, number of these old roles which existed will not be there. And uh, the new roles which are coming are either not known that well or you know people who don't have those skills. So there's a resistance to change in terms of you know how do you adopt Gen AI and only then you can get uh, so if you do, if you leave people behind in this, then you are not going to get the ROI, Raji. Right, that's right. the most important thing. So the new leaders need to be evangelists and uh, change agents. They need to continuously learn and develop. I think there is no questions about that. And the last thing is about this uh, being cross-functional collaborators. So you know, no longer can they survive in uh, command and control kind of a leadership yes. in their own vertical. They will have to adopt to this uh, new trend of cross cross functional collaboration. So, in my view, these are a few things which I see which new leaders will have to, or the new skills which the new leaders will have to embed in the era of uh, Gen AI. I love that answer. Thanks for that, um, Avnish. So, that answer actually prompts me to ask you two follow up questions, right? Um, we spoke about leaders, but what about the workforce at large, right? So, according to World Economic Forum, um, you know, by 2025, which is not too far away from where we are now, 85 million jobs may be displaced uh, in this shift in labor between humans and machines, while 97 million new roles may emerge, right? These are things that we don't know what these could be, right? And so this is a division of labor that's happening between the humans and machines and algorithms. So in this context, how should employees at large be thinking in terms of skills and competencies? Yeah, I think this is the uh, trillion dollar question, which which is in front of us, uh, Rajiv. And actually, to be honest, uh, you know, nobody really knows the answer to this. Um, you know, how the new environment is going to unfold is something which is still uh, being worked out as we speak. It's pretty fluid and uh, and dynamic, right? So I think some of the skills which we can definitely look at is uh, digital literacy and data literacy. I think so these two, right, from a leadership point of view also had talked about, but the ability to interrupt, analyze and manipulate data uh, is becoming crucial. And uh, employees should be able to work with data to extract insights. But I think Gen AI is making it much more easier. Uh, it is, uh, you know, it's like uh, a level playing field. And, you know, there's a lot of things where people are saying that, you know, English is the new Java and uh, this new whole concept of prompt engineers. Uh, actually doesn't want you or doesn't need you to be an engineer as well, right? Uh, and so if you are a good prompt engineer and you know how to, how and which LLM to use, I think that particular skill, it will be very key. And that's why I say that, uh, you know, whenever I go to all these education institutes, I tell them, uh, all the students that uh, it's actually not AI which will disrupt you, but your colleague who's sitting right be besides you 
who will disrupt you, right? Who can use these LLMs and foundational models better than you? So that would be digital literacy and data literacy would be key. Then adaptability and flex uh, flexibility as well. I think, uh, you know, from our school days uh, and the way education system is, uh, you know, tuned up at the moment, uh, it is very, uh, very siloed. It is very hardlined, right? right. Uh, that will have to change. So I think uh, flexibility will be important. And uh, the employees also should be open to continuous learning and resilient in the face of change. I think resilience, again, you know, after COVID, it came in a big way uh, that you needed resilience. And I think in Gen AI, it's the same as well. Uh, critical thinking, problem solving, very, very important. Uh, you know, skills in critically analyzing situation, identifying potential problems and uh, developing effective solutions are crucial. Uh, especially as AI takes over routine decision-making processes, right? Uh, creativity and innovation we talked about. Emotional intelligence will be important um, because uh, a lot of this hard data analysis will go to AI and Gen AI, but a lot of things around emotional intelligence and uh, social intelligence will again, uh, so how good are you as a collaborator, for example, and how much uh, you, know, you can empathize with a particular situation? those will be very important. And then finally, you know, collaboration and teamwork, uh, cognitive flexibility, and then leadership skills. I think all these are uh, very, very important. But, uh, you know, if you look at, uh, if I have to call two meta skills, uh, you know, what are important, I think, or two or three, then I would say entrepreneurship uh, still will be one of the most important skills, right? So I, I'm talking about these at a meta level, right? So entrepreneurship... Right leadership and uh, you know emotional eq right i think these are the three i would put at a meta level if you have to survive the the age of gen ai awesome I, I think it's such a comprehensive framework you've given us um and this is something that i often talk about in in keynotes and whenever i uh, uh, sign the book this is the one liner that I, I usually write which is machines are learning are you yeah so you spoke about sure. continuous learning. I think that's a superpower to have in today's context, right? Um, great. So I, I want to also touch upon the uh, the issues that organizations uh, have in terms of adoption, right? While the opportunities are immense. In fact, an MIT Sloan management review study uh, says that, you know, the top challenges in AI adoption uh, has these uh, factors, which is lack of skills, almost 56 percent uh, of the survey respondents said, you know, there, there is a situation of lack of skills, which we've spoken about. Data issues, right? 50 percent of them said this because the starting point for any AI is data, right? If you if you don't have great data, you don't have a great solution. And integration difficulties, you, I think, touched upon that as well. It can't be a standalone. It has to get into the core, right? So keeping all of these factors uh, and the other big thing around this is also culture. Right. So wherever we have a senior leadership conversation, they tend to think that, hey, data is fine. We can deal with this. Integration is fine. It's a technical challenge. We can deal with that. But this fear that is there in the minds of people on what AI might do to my job and the culture building aspect of, uh, you know, psychological safety and uh, freedom to experiment and try new things. Can you throw some light on this? delicate balance between futurizing, humanizing, and personalizing we spoke about. How do we make this AI thing safe for people to embrace? In other words, how do we personalize and humanize this? Yeah, I think uh, we touched upon a lot of these things, uh, Rajiv, earlier as well, right? Uh, because, uh, you know, as I said, that if, uh, if you don't take your people uh, along with you, then uh, any experiment is bound to fail. And I think uh, with Gen AI, this is, uh, uh, you know, even more important. So when we are looking at an organization or, you know, when we are consulting an organization in terms of, you know, readiness, for example, uh, we look at three things, right? And we ask three questions that are you people ready? So this is about uh, the skills and the change management we were talking about. Then we say, are you data ready? So do you have the data? Uh, do you have the data in the, in the shape and patterns in which this is required? Because if you don't, then a massive uh, pre-work which is required to do is to actually get uh, data in order, right? So are you people ready? Are you data ready? And then are you enterprise ready? 
and the enterprise ready again is a lot of it is about leadership uh, and change management and a lot about uh, safety and responsible AI as well. So we look from an Accenture perspective, we look at all these three things in terms of readiness assessment. And uh, if these are not in order, then the chances of a Gen AI POC or a project going ahead and uh, succeeding are, are not much, right? So a lot of our work starts with the readiness assessment around these three things. Awesome. That's so wonderful to hear. And um, as we look ahead, Avni, so you also have this vantage point of thinking about the future, connecting all of these dots. So if we project ourselves into, let's say, 2030, five years down the road, what will we all be doing? <laughs> so this is a question which is asked to me by everybody. And I think, uh, to be honest, it's very difficult, right? And it also some way goes to this whole thing of singularity. Right. When is singularity going to hit us? Uh, now, those dates earlier, it was about 2047. Now, you know, people are talking about as early as 2035 uh, or, you know, even earlier. But what's going to happen in 2030, which is like five years from now, right? Uh, if I knew that the answer to this question, I'll be somewhere else, Rajiv. So to be honest, it's in today's time, it's very difficult to even predict what's going to happen the next month, right? Because every day there is a new technology, a new invention, a new kind of a concept is coming up, right? And not only from a tech point of view, but geopolitical as well. Everything is so volatile uh, that it is very, it's becoming very difficult for to comprehend where exactly the world is going, right? So, but I think overall, if I have to say it, some things which will remain uh, probably the way they are and probably get more important is, you know, leadership skills. Definitely you need more and better leaders you know, to navigate your organizations and your workforce. So that is not going to change. You will need strong leadership skills. And then again, I think, you know, if you look at my own children, because this is a question which is very relevant for children nowadays, that what are they going to do? What jobs will they be? And, you know, how how things are changing. So it's very volatile for them. Right. It's not in our days. Uh, so I have told both my sons that, uh, you know, you should try to be entrepreneurs, both of you. Right. Uh, whether you succeed, don't succeed or, you know, you become a unicorn or you are a modest success. I think that career uh, is a better career than, you know, uh, always trying to understand what's happening next in the professional world with corporates and, you know, other things, because I think that will become more and more volatile. So the more you can control your own destiny, the more you can become a job giver than a job seeker. I think I would put my bet onto that in the new world or, you know, what's going to happen in 2030. Uh, so th that is my answer to that question and how, you know, people can prepare for it. Yeah, I love that. The best way to know the future is to create it, is what you're saying. So that, exactly. that's wonderful. Um, so the last question I have, uh, Avnish, is, you know, today there's so much emphasis on learning, right? Because as you mentioned, every month there is something new uh, that is happening. Uh, two questions, in fact, here. What is your learning superpower? How do you so absorb all my of My learning superpower is actually my startups. So I'm very right. lucky that um, uh, Accenture has given me the job, which, uh, you know, which uh, requires me to be uh, right at the top of the learning curve, right? Because I'm working with smart people like you and, and many other founders, some of, some of these I just talked about as well. So because I'm constantly scouting and identifying uh, startups which can augment uh, Accenture's own technology capabilities, I am, you know, uh, face to face with a lot of such smart people who are developing, you know, some fantastic solutions and platforms and IP. So a lot of my learning actually happens during my job of working with these startups. Yes, there's a lot of uh, official learning and uh, structured learning, which I get in Accenture as well. And I do my own readings, but nothing compares to the, the actual learning, which my startup founders teach me, right? That kind of teachings I get from them is, uh, is significant. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what keeps me on my toes. Awesome. And Avnish, they say, uh, they ask this provocative question often, uh, right? Which is, when was the last time you did something new for the first time? What would that be for you? That, yeah, that's not the most uh, easy question to say. But yes, uh, something which I have now started doing a little bit better, or I don't know whether it's new or not, 
is about uh, tinkering with the technology and building something right so i have been more of because i am not an engineer so you know i i uh, rely on uh, a lot of theoretical knowledge and what i get from my startups but uh, i think i have started tinkering with my own hands uh, with my two sons and you know started building small applications and uh, looking at how technology is all coming together especially you know hardware software and all that so something which i had not done earlier but i have started using my hands and building few small things awesome that's super awesome to hear because today uh, it's important to develop a sense of curiosity uh, so anish that's a wonderful response uh, we often talk about curiosity being a superpower right without which you don't ask the foundational questions on why or why is it like this it's great that you're putting hands on approach right tinkering and building and everybody today is a maker right and we we think about that in the process of learning experiential learning comes through actual experience right so it's been awesome talking to you um, avnish thank you so much for your insight and for your time and i'm sure our viewers and listeners would appreciate every single word of what you've mentioned uh, during this podcast thank you so much for kicking this off for us and thanks to all our viewers and listeners for tuning into the uh, learning curve we shall bring you the next episode very soon with another great personality and insights on making organizations and the workforce future ready until next time take care and goodbye